Well, good morning. Glad to see you here on this crazy, as we talked about, crazy snowy day. I know that uh, you know on the Washington side, uh, a lot of school closures, CV Unified School District, Spokane, you know, others, which always create great some interesting uh, family dynamics, you know, for those you know at home and trying to be able to navigate through that. So uh, stay safe, you know, enjoy the weather. You know, it is gorgeous, you know, out there. In fact, I literally just got back in. Sorry, I was a minute or two late because I was snow blowing as well. Just trying to, you know, get stuff taken care of out here in Idaho. Um, by the way, a couple uh, differences. Um, I'm in, here in Idaho, um, there uh, is no school delays and no school closures. Um, so my kids were very disappointed that they were not living in Washington, you know, this morning. Uh, but it goes to show you once again that uh, Washington is a bunch of sissies compared to Idahoans. Anyway, so with that being said, we are jumping in to 1 Samuel chapter 18. So as we jump into 18, glad you're here at home and, and uh, you know, what a great, you know, day to watch. If you get a chance just to watch the snow fall, you know, um, and so, you know, uh, just to make sure you take care of yourself, you know, as you're out there. 1 Samuel 18, we just, uh, just completed David killing Goliath. You know, um, so just a lot of stuff going on. Verse 18, verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, he met with Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made him solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and and belt. So um, this is fascinating because one of the things that I've always thought, maybe you did as well, is um, what did Jonathan do to not deserve uh, being the next king of Israel? I mean, you think about it, he, he, he has a relationship, you know, uh, with the Lord. He has a relationship, you know, connected, you know, to him on a regular basis. And, and yet, you know, um, God chooses David. And, and, uh, and, and it shows to me again uh, Jonathan's deep commitment to God wasn't based uh, on his identity as a king's son. It wasn't based on his identity, you know, as the prince. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, again, you know, um, his identity based on his position. It was his identity based on his connection with the Lord, and the Lord has revealed something to him as it concerns David. And so he gives him, you know, really the, the uh, uh, clothing and the articles that would signify the king, the next king of Israel, the prince. And he gives that to David out of his love and connection to David and for David. And so it's just amazing to me. A lot of times we give the credit to, to uh, David, but we need to give some credit to, to Jonathan in terms of his willingness to say, hey, I'm gonna do what God asked me to do. I'm gonna follow his ways and I'm gonna be secure in that wherever that may lead. And so um, what, what an amazing, you know, amazing, you know, uh, thing. And that he didn't show great jealousy and he didn't show that, that he actually developed a deep friendship and the friendship, you know, was based on God. Now, some people have, have read into this and said, well, obviously they, you know, entered into some sort of homosexual relationship. I've heard that probably within the last five years as one of the pushes. There's just no indication of that. There's no word in that two guys, you know, can have, you know, a deep bonding relationship without sexual encounter taking place. And there's no Hebrew word that would indicate otherwise. Because um, uh, I know that some of you have asked about that, you know, as it pertains to Jonathan and David's relationship. So verse five, though, as we jump in, verse five, whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. So Saul's thinking, all right, I got this David guy. This is amazing. What a good, good move on my part. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, which is Goliath, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced with, for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Uh, so this is the number one hit, you know, back in uh, this day uh, that was played on all the radio stations. Uh, this is a common occurrence. Again, the men would go off the war and when they would come back, especially victorious, there would be a homecoming parade. We've seen something similar, you know, in our country, you know, uh, not counting Vietnam, you know, but our country when men, you know, and women come home from war. And so in that day, it was all only men, you know, who'd go out to these battles and they'd come home and the 
the ladies would sing songs and they'd be excited you know, about the victory that was provided. Now, what's fascinating again is that they credit Saul, but they give even more credit to David. So instead of saying, yes, this is actually what happened, because the truth is, Saul, you didn't go fight Goliath. You did not you know, win the battle of that day. And so they're actually giving you credit. This isn't a diss. This isn't something that should be taken. It's almost like when you're a part of an office or a team and you get credit for something and somebody praises you and you're like, man, that feels good. And then somebody praises somebody else or something they did and you get jealous. You're like, wait, wait a minute, why? Why would you do that? And, and so then this made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with 10,000s and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. Oh, he's gonna find out. So from that time on, David, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. You know, um, oftentimes we get intimidated by the gifts, the talents, you know, or the praise that other people receive. And, and, and it happens in the church as well. I've seen pastors, you know, do this, you know, as well. It's almost uh, interesting sometimes there'll be people in the church that'll come up to me and just be like, you know, hey, you know, you're a good speaker, but I really love Tyler. Tyler's my favorite. Um, you know, I love Steve. I love, I love Ryan. I love, and I'm like, awesome. This, great. You know, praise the Lord. Uh, that's not going to make me jealous because it's not about me. You know, it's not supposed to be about me. It's supposed to be about him. Oh, by the way, that phrase, my favorite speaker is uh, Tyler or Trevor. Uh, that comes from my own household, you know, so you can live with that. You know, when your kids are saying, dad, uh, like my, my uh, daughter, Anjali, on Christmas Eve said, dad, your sermon was boring. You know, so <laughs> those are the things that I get to deal with when it comes to that. So, you know, you're just like, wait a minute, what's my heart motivation? You know, is my heart motivation for credit for me or is my heart motivation to, to be able to give credit to God? And so we see this in the church, we see this in business, we see this in life. Like, how dare you give that person credit when look at me and look what I have done. Why am I not receiving at least as much, if not more credit for what I have done? And so Saul's heart was not attuned again to God. So the very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul and began to rave in his house like a madman. Remember, you know, God is not the one who created, but he is allowing, you know, this to take place. He is allowing, you can read in uh, Job where Satan comes, you know, to the presence of God and God gives him permission, you know, um, to go after, you know, uh, Job to show Satan, you know, his commitment to him. Now, we may not understand this. I don't understand this fully, but at the same time, I trust that God knows best. And that he gave his spirit to Saul and he has removed his spirit from Saul. Again, he doesn't do that in the New Testament because our connection is through Christ and it's the Holy Spirit that's inside of us. Then after, you know, Saul was afraid of David, you know, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. You know, uh, oh, by the way, I missed this whole part. Uh, the, and Saul began to rave in his house like a madman. Da David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand. One was in a worship instrument, one was in an instrument of violence, and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him, not once, but twice. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm sitting here, okay, you mess with me, and you know, mess with the bull, you're gonna get the horns, right? You've ever heard that phrase? You're, like, you're gonna mess with me. I might turn my, my cheek one time, but a second time? I mean, you know, come on, what in the world's going on? David, I mean, and Saul and all, and all the people, can you imagine David being like, uh, you're nothing compared to Goliath? Uh, let me just take you down and take you out right now. I'm supposed to be king anyway. Uh, let's just make this official. Let's do this right now. But David, his heart was saying, no, I'm gonna wait for God's timing regardless of the outcome, that blows me away. Waiting on God, his timing, his direction, his leadership, regardless of the outcome. Uh, that should be something that should challenge all of us to, to, as we look at the life of David and how much he's gonna be running for his life and the opportunities he's gonna have to actually kill King Saul and he chooses not to time and time and time again because he says, no, vengeance is mine, says the Lord that we leave that up to him instead of causing revenge or taking matters into our hands. You know, that's a word that I need to receive, you know, on this day. Uh, then Saul was afraid of David, you know, uh, uh, verse 12, uh, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. Finally, Saul sent him away and appointed him commander over a thousand men and David faithfully led his troops into battle. God was with David. Saul saw that and that made Saul afraid. Well, David continued to succeed in everything he did. Why? For the Lord was with him. 
When Saul recognized this, he became even more afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was so successful at leading his troops into battle. And yet it never seemed to go to David's head. So he was in a pasture guarding sheep, you know, that he was without any fanfare. He's killing bears and lions with his bare hands. No praise, no acclamation. He was okay with who God created him to be. He didn't live his life based on the praises of others. That might be a word for some of you today. You know, I know so many people, you know, who live their life based on the affirmation of other people. And if they don't get the affirmation, they have a hard time. Understand, you and I have affirmation from the Lord. So as we close on this day, my prayer is some of the things that we talked about that God may be encouraging and challenging you is number one, you know, do you have a deep friend in your life like David had with Jonathan? Do you have someone that you have chosen to prioritize and befriend and not waiting for someone to do it to you? Secondly, can you and I be like David? You know, recognizing that we're gonna wait upon the Lord and his timing, and it's not our vengeance and our wrath, but it's his. You know, or third, you know, maybe for us, you know, on this day, we're gonna live for the praise of God, not for the praise of man. That that's not what we're after on this side of eternity. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for, one again, once again, the lesson of David. And I pray that you would just lead and guide and direct us. Thank you for Jonathan. Father, thank you for the lessons learned. And I pray that your spirit would guide and lead and direct our steps on this snowy day. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, some of you guys, you know, have asked, you know, about services, you know, tonight. Uh, they are still on online no matter what. We're still going to have services online no matter what. We'll make a determination on site. It'll be, it'll be determined based on not the snow. It'll be determined much more on this potential ice you know, freezing rain kind of thing uh, about 2.30, you know, this afternoon, you know, but uh, as of right now, plan is uh, services. We have closed the offices, you know, uh, for the school day because uh, so many of our staff have kids and the school districts have closed. And so it just makes it better for everyone. And so um, services themselves yet to be determined right now, still planning on having services 100% online and most likely on site, but we'll let you know by 2.30 this afternoon. All right, have a great day and we'll talk to you soon.